very lucky. Our family, Adolf Hitler, did us a favor, believe it or not, to prove that there was no Jewish blood. Each German citizen had to do a 10 generation pedigree. All these were sent to Berlin and 80% or 90% were destroyed. My family did save theirs. So I have our family back to the 1500s. And like Linda said, uh, we descended from Johann, and he came from a family of blacksmiths and weavers, but he decided to change careers, and so he went into medicine. And he became a student at the University of Vienna. And because Bismarck, the prime minister of uh, Germany and Austria were having war problems, he had to leave because they were hanging the medical students. And uh, so he left and he had to... Uh, uh, yeah. Travel by darkness and hide in the barns during the day so he wouldn't be caught. So he re-entered medical school at the university, and I'm not sure how to pronounce this, Tübingen in Germany, and he did get his medical degree in 1949, and he was 25 years old. In 1852, he left for America. He boarded the ship Beatrice, and on board was a nice, pretty little young lady who was also traveling to America, and they must have had a shipboard romance because they got married when they got to New York and opened a practice in New York for a short time before moving to Canada. And he stayed in Canada until uh, he decided to move down here in 1882. He started having medical problems in Canada. But he had a very success successful practice, so you know, it had to be pretty brave to just leave everything and move. And like Linda said, he came down with one son, CA, and four daughters. Okay, uh, one of the daughters, Emma married Carl Burkhart in Hampton. And that's how the Stinkelmeyers are related to the Burkharts in Hampton. And we have Eddie and Lee and Wives here. Wives and Barbara, I'm sorry. They've come to represent the Burkharts from Hampton. So that's how we're related. I know a lot of people wonder how we're related to the Burkharts. Okay, another daughter, Sophia, married Theodore von Gerichten, who did the stained glass windows at St. John's Church. And he really did them for no cost because he was a member of St. John's. And as you can see, the windows are just beautiful. And, and thankfully, they survived the storm. Catholic Church, too. Yeah. Oh, the descendants did Mother Angelica. trips and this one was in St. Louis when they were young. But this is Sophia and this is Theodore von Gerichten who did do the windows. And you did show them this to in the civic and the church affairs. He was a charter member of St. John's and a charter member of St. Paul's. He stayed with St. Paul's until he left in 1890. Now, I'm not sure exactly. I know there's history of St. John's that tells why they separated. But anyway, he uh, was quite influential in that. But his health sent him back to New York where he lived until 1896. 
Katie died in Rochester. All right, son C.A. came when he was 17 years old. He traveled south with his father, and he began working at the Clybacker Crump store in Hansville, which later became the Dreyer store. And I believe this is where your story is now, Eddie, down there at uh, the drugstore. Isn't this close? <laughs> but I mean, uh, that was the original store, and Adam Dreyer bought the store when John Clybacker died, and Charles Crump moved to New Orleans. And that's where CA started after he worked with CA Prince for a short time. In 1888, he decided to move back to Coleman City. And like Linda said, he bought the, uh, the building and the stock from R.E. Lee and began a business. And he was doing well the same year he married Aunt Maggie Drake. And Aunt Maggie, now she was a character. And she was not going to be one of those sit-at-home wives letting the husband do all the control. She was very much involved with the store and with the business, and I guess she inherited that from the drapers. Mm -hmm. And we used to go over there when we were children. And we were given warning because it was like going to see the king and queen because you had to sit quietly in your chairs with Aunt Maggie and Uncle C.A. sitting at the top of the room with a moose head and a spittoon. You couldn't say a word unless you were spoken to. And we had to be all dressed up. You couldn't go in blue jeans and shorts. We had to have our Sunday best on. And for me, it was hard not to talk. Now, where was this house? The house is uh, across from the store. State yeah, yeah. National Bank was there. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful. And I've got pictures in the house. But anyway, that's, that's where it was. And we had to sit there until we were dismissed. But we were always served mm -hmm. buffalo rock and German cookies. Well, Katie Azure worked for Ed Meg and CA her whole life. She never got married. She devoted her whole life to them. And so we got dismissed, and of course we politely walked out till we got out of sight and then ran into the kitchen, and she gave us our treat. About twice a year, Betsy, the youth fellowship of St. John's would go over there. Really? We would oh, go you're kidding. Once at, at Christmas. We would sing, you know, we go over for Carol. She was a delightful woman. She was. But she didn't put up with any, no nonsense. Any, no, no. And, <laughs> and we were told she couldn't have children, so that's why they had no children. I love But they place. sponsored many, many, many charities and, and orphanages and did quite a lot of work. Okay, C.A. Since Emma Bar Burkhart was his sister. I was telling Eddie about this. Apparently she had some type of standing order. She lived in Hansville from the grocery store. And CA would load all this up on the train, head him to Birmingham. They would get to Hansville, and apparently there was some time frame because they don't live close to the tracks. And there was a special signal the train would do. And they would just literally throw the groceries out, and the Burkharts would have to run, try to catch them and, <laughs> and take them home. But that was their standing order. Betsy, in the early days, Highway 31 was the railway. Okay, so that so yeah, y'all were closer. Day, yeah. Well, you're still. It could have been. But that was the story that the train took all the packages to the Burkharts. Judy Jones wrote about that a little bit in her article. But CA was on the city council for 25 years. He was director of Parker Bank and Trust, which was the largest bank in North Alabama at the time. A member of the Board of Education, the Mason, the Rotary Club, Coleman Illiteracy Council, officer of the Coleman Commercial Club, which I have something here. Coleman Society <laughs> Club, St. John's, donated the land where the high school is now. The first horse-drawn delivery wagon, which we have. The first steam-powered operated cotton gin, which was replaced in 1949, where my father used to have a cotton gin where O.F. Richter sits now. He was a very large land owner, owner in and out of state, including Panama City Beachfront, had a summer home in Rochester, and also had what they considered a summer home here, 
is where Uncle Carl lived, the Kessler home. Across from the high school. Across from the high school, and this is where. Uh, Dixie. Say what? Yeah, it has to be, because that's Aunt Maggie's house. That's what this kept getting us confused. There are all these pictures. But this was Uncle Carl's house before they developed the subdivision up there, and the high school is right here. And this is probably only a mile from where he lived in town, but when the cholera outbreak and several diseases passed through, this is where they went. The new high school. so people could stay. And there were bunk houses and whatever. So we've got all kinds of pictures and there's some discrepancies as far as what building exactly was what. But this is Aunt Maggie's house. And I know this camp house sat across from the present store where the parking lot is. And um, so we just assume that's what this is. There's nobody left to come. I never envisioned it would be that fancy for a camp house at all. I thought it was just a... Well, that's a... And I think I converted it, it, but... Yeah. Okay, this was produced, I don't know, maybe some of y'all have seen these or not, by the Coleman Commercial Club in 1910. And Grandpa put this out, and it was a pamphlet sent all over the country. You see this one to promote Coleman. And there's a lot of little interesting facts in here about town and what they promoted. You know, no Negroes. Um, I mean, it's, it's fun to look at. And Uncle C.A., he was a very good businessman. He surrounded himself with good, friendly, courteous employees. But they had to follow his strict policy of fair dealing. So, he was very successful at that. Okay, George Henry was the son of Frederick, who was C.A.'s brother. He came down in 1890 to work for his uncle C.A. at the store. And he married Elizabeth Clybacker in 1912, and they had five children. That's our grandparents. That's our grandparents. He was on the Waterworks Board, Board of Education, Mason, Rotary, City Council, many social clubs. He was also on the Air Raid Committee during World War II. And in Grandma's house, there was, I really don't know what that was. It was like a siren? A hand cracked siren. A hand siren, and we used to play with that when we were kids. <laughs> and I don't know what happened to that. I wish I had that. He was Grand Master of the Grand Lodge of Odd Fellows, Board Director of Coleman Commission. He built a home site on the Mulberry, which was known as Steeplemeyer's Camp. He hosted yes. many school functions, uh, church functions, and we used to go down there all the time and play. And I'm sure a lot of people here remember Steeplemeyer's Camp. And we, Mary and her husband tried to clean the camp up and, and going to try to salvage it, but now it's kind of gone back to the wild. But it's still a beautiful place. I went down there on my uh, senior class picnic. Did you? And uh, must have been in 1944. And we went in the lake, a um, creek or whatever was running by there. And uh, one of the girls waded out, and all of a sudden you'd get over your head. Yeah. And I could, you enough, I'd give her a shove towards land, and I could kick enough to get back on the mountain. Across the river was a great, huge, big rock. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, I remember the rock. That's all I remember is being in the water. Oh, it was beautiful. Crab soup. But well, I we have no never pictures. could swim, so I couldn't go over there. Well, we there are no pictures, pictures of the camp. Or yeah, the camp house. Right. If anybody has pictures. any pictures or know anybody that took pictures, give us anything. JW? No. Yeah. Oh, okay. JW, we, we can't let this go by now. No. JW worked at the store, JW Tagle, for years. Jan Ann told me that you have more information on the Stephen Myers mm -hmm. and, and Uncle C.I. and Grandpa than anybody well, in the county. I'm going to give Jan Ann she right now. <laughs> like, There's not enough time in the day for me to start. Well, you don't have to get it. Yeah, he's been bending my ear right here for five hours. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's you know, that's some good out. stuff that went on that store. Right? Well, it did. But I've just got pictures I'll pass around. They're, they're marked. It's got the interior of the store, uh, things that they sold. Uh, Stephen Meyer store was like our Walmart today. One stop shopping. And the customers are always right. Yes. The very right. Always told to say that. Definitely. No matter what. Right. And we couldn't go in there and. Cause any kind of excitement because Danny was with us. Who was the lady that worked in the household? Lady Asia? Oh, which household? Oh, Tilly. 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 Now, Gertie had the candy. Gertie King had the candy. Now, here's Gertie in here. So this far. is a picture of the employees, and Gertie oh, is in the We would go down here in the park. Oh, here's Gertie Foote. Right here, peeking out. Ruth Shepard. Here's Gertie Foote. Anybody remember her stuff? She's peeking out from behind. And I'd love to have it. Okay. I'd love to have it. It's kind of heavy. We got there. Some of the store. Gone way back. Okay, it was probably not because they had groceries and they weren't there. Yeah, we didn't see that. Yeah, we didn't see that. Well, Eddie, go ahead. I want to ask you a question. He used to go spend the night with Burkhart so he could ride a school train in the back. They had big wheels on Big wheels. That's as far as it went. So it went back and forth. Next well, Hansel was an important part of all that minute. All right, Grandpa George became naturalized in 1906 because he was born in Canada. And I do have a copy of that. And he used to host all these poker games in our basement, our Grandma's basement. They had little special dinners that would come in because Grandma was not really up on that. And when we were kids, we'd go down there and there were still movies. So uh, many of the monks at St. Bernard came over. Yeah. <laughs> and he was a part of, huh? Which house was that? Grandma's house. Had that little side the entrance. Right there behind where that bank building is. Mr. C.A.'s house. No, no, this is George's house. Which is over, right up from the hospital. Yeah, I know Old hospital. Right and there was a little side yeah. entrance that went yeah. straight into the basement. Okay. And that's where everybody had to go. And Grandpa became a partner of CA until his death in 1951. And the store was a beginning for several things. We had a relative called Charles Flybacker. I don't know if anybody remembers Charles. We did him. Did you? Okay. And he came and spoke at the Brother. Yes. 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 Brother. Yeah, the Charles, it's here. Oh, okay. And so he's got his star at the store. And, and um, I used to love just to, to listen to him because he would write stories. This is the house I was talking about. The yeah. entrance. Yeah. Yeah. The play I was talking about. Right. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Thankfully, the tornado didn't get that one. Either. I know it. But the secret Where is that at? 
open the house too. No, no, it's just a block off of 278. Uh, you remember the Arthur Homes? They got the Parker Homes yeah. across 278. Yeah. What was the occasion of all these people? The Majestic Stove Company was there doing a promotion. Oh, okay. Majestic Stove. So, Majestic Stove. So this was Grandma's house, and these were some of the ads and things that they used to run in a newspaper. And now we'll get to the kids. Uh, George had five children. He had Carl, Betty, George, John, and Louise. Okay, Uncle Carl graduated from Birmingham Southern with a degree in journalism, and he always wanted to be a writer. But he was summoned home to work in the store. And like Linda said, he was manager of the millinery and the ladies. And he married his uh, high school sweetheart, Catherine Harrell. They had three children, Carl, Karen, and Lydia, who's now deceased. And Uncle Carl didn't serve in World War II because he was colorblind. And I didn't know this, and I was up there one day, and he came out of his room, and he was in the most god-awful outfit you ever saw. <laughs> and Lydia was there, and she, she said, no, Daddy, this ain't going to work. And Katie was already deceased. So she took him back in the room and had him change his clothes. And I never knew that. And he said, Aunt Katie was the one that always kind of gathered his clothes for him and always made sure he didn't embarrass himself. Because <laughs> he could uh, come out with some deuces. Right. Uncle Carl belonged to the Rotary, Kiwanis, he was director of the United Way, he was burgomaster of the Oktoberfest, a member of the original Flying 50, who uh, promoted industry to this area. He was on the uh, church council at St. John's. Now, Uncle John, I don't know if y'all remember Uncle John, but he was probably the most athletic of the family. He had a great personality. And he was always, he was president of his class. He, he was very popular. And at the age of 16, down here at Phelan, right where I lived, he had his arm out to give a signal. And he was sideswiped. And there was a lot of loss of blood. He was rushed to Birmingham. You imagine how long it took to get to Birmingham. The doctors wanted to amputate his arm, and Grandma refused. And he wishes that Grandma had let them do that because he thinks things could have been a little bit different for him. And uh, he loved his gambling. He loved his Alabama football. And he was one of my dear uncles because he just had the personality. And I'm sure most of you, J.W. can uh, tell some stories about him. Didn't he walk through all the cold and football? Yeah, he did because he couldn't drive. He didn't have a driver's license. That's so. Uh, Okay, Aunt Betty. He was also very active in politics. Yes, oh, Jim Colson's <laughs> campaign. <laughs> Even though it was a Democrat, I don't understand it because he became a Republican. But Aunt Betty uh, graduated from the University of Alabama, but she married an Auburn man. <laughs> she became an Auburn Tiger. Well, we all can't be Tiger. Well, she raised two little Tiger Reds. And you could not go to a family reunion without having... Why are you so good with hogs? Because he's, he's Auburn. <laughs> this is Uncle Campbell. This is who he she was married. Really, he was a nice man. He was a nice man. man. I never saw him being hogs. Where did they live? Apples. 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 <laughs> and he was uh, with uh, Ingram's Chicken Farm or something. He had something to do with the chicken industry. He's a trading salesman. But he, he had something to do with that. And I watched one iron bow with her and Uncle Carl. It was like watching two of our children. And so we, at family so reunions, crazy. we tried not to smirk too much if we beat Auburn. But it still happened. <laughs> Aunt Louise graduated from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And she wanted to be a model. And Aunt Louise was a beautiful, beautiful woman. And so she went to New York. She had a blind date with a man named Elliot Laws, and it was 
during World War II, she got caught up in all the romance of World War II and the soldiers leaving, the soldiers coming. She got married. She moved to New Jersey, so she became a misplaced southerner in New Jersey, and all of her cousins became Yankee cousins. Do you ever see them anymore? Oh, yeah. I mean, do you hear from them? Yeah, 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 yeah. They come. We're supposed They're to have a reunion soon. In Atlanta. In Atlanta. In Atlanta. In Atlanta. 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 Okay, our father was George Charles, and he was an uh, avid sportsman. He loved to duck hunt and fish and hunt deer and loved his football and his Friday night fights. And I can still remember Friday night, 9 o'clock, those stupid fights would come on, and I can still hear the ringing of the bell, and you couldn't make a sound because he was watching his fight. And he fell through a greenhouse roof when he was young, and he really injured his knee, and so he was he could not serve in the uh, war either. But there are all kinds of rumors that uh, ran through town as to why George and Carl could not serve in the war effort, and lots of rumors spread about the Germans. The Germans were not liked, from what we understand, very well during World War II. And Uncle Carl went to mail a pair of shoes I think to a relative in Germany. Oh, that just, he was supporting the Fuhrer, you know. And so they had to live down that aspect. All right, Daddy was on the Coleman Power Board. He was State Cattlemen Association President. He showed old Hereford cattle. And that was one of his passions. And these are pictures of Daddy. He was quite the charmer. And I don't know many people that really didn't like that. He was active with Child Haven, and I'm sure a lot of y'all remember the little Pee Wee games that they used to have here where Stiefel Myers, Ligabers, Ponders, they all played football. Okay, Stiefel Myers had a lot of members that were from Child Haven. And a lot of the Child Haven kids would come to our house, and Daddy was very, very instrumental in helping them. St. John's Church, Rotary, Mason. He was uh, chairman of the Strawberry Festival. And one time, Daddy took us, Mary and I would either travel with Daddy alone, sometimes we just like to go ride with Daddy. And we were riding around, he stopped at a field, it was a strawberry patch. And there was a man out there in the patch, and he stopped. And this man came over and he patted me on his head and said, Oh, you're a little flathead. Well, you know, I didn't know that was a. Uh, uh, the lingo for the Germans, and I really had a complex for a while because I thought I had a flat head. <laughs> <laughs> See, it was really kind of embarrassing. He was president of the quarter club, he was quarterback club. He was a fraternity brother at Bear Bryant at the University of Alabama, City of Maine. And Bear Bryant used to come to our house because Daddy was a huge recruiter in North Alabama. But he was also a disciplinarian. One time, Uncle Carl, Lydia, Daddy, and I were in church, and Uncle Carl was not much of a disciplinarian with Lydia. Well, Lydia got up and started to walk on the uh, uh, pews. All right, well, I noticed Daddy wasn't doing anything. You know, he wasn't even looking, so I thought I could do it too. But Lydia just kept on walking on the pews. And never did a thing. No, I couldn't. <laughs> Lake George was named after him after his death, and he died on Father's Day, 1960, at the age of 44, after battling nine years with leukemia. He had a big heart, and he'd literally give the shirt off his back, which there are many stories in which he actually did that. He instilled in all of us the love of the horses, land, and roll tide football. We had no choice. It had to be roll tide. There were four of us, Linda, my brother George, Mary, and myself. And all the answers, ancestors I spoke of today were staunch, conservative Republicans, and we still are. But even back then, the Republicans were not too well thought of. And Daddy ran for office one time on the Republican ticket. Well, he lost, because here he was in Democrat country. But anyway, that's all I've got to say about my family, but I've got other things. And if anybody has any questions, Y'all have
have any questions? No, here's the strawberry. I'll see enough pictures. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Like George, it's just that he was very instrumental in, in the activities of the county, and I guess he had that long battle with leukemia, and he still kept trying to support the county, even though he didn't feel us. So, so what was his relationship with the high fellows? Friends. Friends? Friends? They went to church together. Right. He and Herbert were friends. Yeah. So wasn't the late Well, I know it's right across from it. I don't know the city yeah. was the one that did it. Right yeah. right yeah. right well, that's what he was right saying. Right. The height millers didn't yeah. want to give the land yeah. up part of the lake. property was going to be Margaret. See, I don't, he wouldn't have anything to do with that. Because yeah. oh. it was named after Herbert's sister, Margaret, inherited the property right across from the home place. There were several acres there. And as I understand it, she sold all well, that pro property, and the rest of the family didn't care right. that she did that. Oh, I, I think and, Daddy and yeah. Robert had some friction over that. Or something. Yeah, they didn't tell me that um, later on, Herbert, when he was not in his right mind, he started talking about George, yeah. and you know, like they were best friends. Well, that was my and, memory. You know. The past, you know. Save the store to make it a museum. Yeah. If we could have saved it with all the stuff in there, but the women had nothing to say. They didn't about. get women. They should have left the women on it. And the ladies had great stories. We were going to look at good business deals, and it probably still didn't go in. Is it possible to repurchase the store? The way they've divided it up, uh, I don't think Margo would sell it. She owns part of it where she has her shop. Lombard Willingham has the rest. I've got a lot of it in the upstairs. I've got a lot of it in the Because they're well established. Yeah. How many of you remember shopping in the Stephen Meyer store? Oh, yeah. Do you remember? My daddy would carry me in there, and I had such big feet, he'd tell me, just give me the box. Oh. Do you remember the little change line that ran in there in the men's department to, uh, it was the little cups. To, uh, to Margie, to wasn't it Margie? Margie, Margie would set Margie. up in her little wall yeah. and yeah. 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 yeah, they would make the changes and the money and the yeah. 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 Oh, I was fascinated with that. We can't leave yeah. without yeah. talking yeah. about yeah. Tilly Malco. Oh, oh, well, Tilly yeah. was yeah. the clothing yeah. department. In fact, I still have. Tilly's not in yeah. here, is yes. she? No. And I still I have a half box. I have a half box. I've got a half boxes, too. I'm surprised Tilly Malco was. A jewel in the women's department. She was. And uh, she was always matched up. She went to St. Paul's Church. And she was always matched up from hat to, yeah. to foot. And they said when she died, she, um, in her closet, every, every outfit was from the hat to the clothes, yeah, to the that. shoes, all hanging Scripture together. Wow. Hundreds of them. When oh, she wow. When, when, when Terry used to walk to work, she had, she had a walking shoe. She'd walk to work. And she'd get up and she'd hang it for spire. She'd always do it like this. Yeah. And uh, she'd take them off, put her walking shoes never saw a piece of dust on it. Mm -hmm. She even had the boxes, the paper. Everything. 
She They're polished them before she put them up. My gosh. And she, when they got a load of clothes in, half the time she had them sold. Because she, <laughs> knew, she knew who, who, who was on it. Miss Tiffany. And, uh, they were several oh, ready. Yeah. yeah. She, she just called them up. They'd come in. And, uh, but I had to sweep around them. I know what <laughs> who was the uh, Who was the cashier that sat up there? That was Mary Ellen Margaret. and Margaret. 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 Next one, they put the real What was her last name? Okay, Mary Ellen Slosser. Yeah. yeah but her husband was an electrician. Yeah, yeah. 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 But was it there a spit in that one time? A what? Margaret married a promo. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. Oh, yeah, Margaret, yeah. Yeah. That was called, that was the photographer Slosser. Oh, that's it. Yeah. 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 My yeah. baby picture was made by Claude Slosser. Yeah, most of these are Slosser. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. I have been doing some things for the cemetery tour, and we'll get to that in a minute. But uh, one of the family that we may or may not be portraying, and uh, uh, we pretty well have, have set, but it depends on if we get enough information on the family, I don't think it'll be a problem, is the cry lines. Uh, Miss Dodd, I think, suggested them. And uh, so I was looking back in old papers, and in... August 27, 1936, in the Coleman Democrat, that would be 76 years ago tomorrow, uh, there's a story about several new structures going up in the city. Uh, and one of them, the reason uh, I have this, I mean the reason in particular I got it was that uh, several new business houses and residences are being added to the improvements going on at a constantly accelerated place, pace in the city. The new house building, and the two-story addition to the Star Billiard Hall will greatly improve First Avenue East. In the same block, Leonard Crotline is constructing a two-story modern store building on the side of his old store, recently torn down. But since it was 76 years ago tomorrow, and it's an exhibit of, we hear that uh, the more things change, the more they stay the same. I thought I would just run over very quickly because we won't get to our program now. Some of the headlines and the stories on the front page. Um, the first one is the WPA expands large sums in common. Uh, for the 13 months the program operated through July 31st, the Works Progress Administration 
invested $69,168 in projects in Coleman County, according to the state director. Uh, for Alabama, the total expenditures for the same period was $18 million more. Um, I went to the mayoral forum this week and they were, there was talk about how we should use local contractors more. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. But in this story then it says, uh, while all materials purchases are made by the U.S. Treasury Department on low bids, regardless of the point of origin of the bids, Mr. Crow said approximately 90% of all orders were placed through Alabama firms. Uh, if I was sponsored, I mean, there had been some question about why we weren't using uh, Coleman firms. And so the, the thing was sometimes, uh, this at the mayoral forum about some of the people that were hired here after the storm, FEMA required, you know, they be hired this way. But anyway, under sponsorship of the state health department, 68 miles of new ditches and 18 miles of existing ditches has been excavated to lessen the incidence of malaria. Now we're having more spray in for the West Nile virus, you know. Uh, three for mayor, nine for council. Around a thousand votes are expected in the municipal election Tuesday. <laughs> um, large convict camp to be built here at once because of the problem with crime. Uh, approximately, uh, there was uh, questions at the mayoral forum about annexation. Uh, approximately 25 new blocks will be added to the area of the city uh, because of the high school addition. Uh, and the people have been assured they had to go to the city, I mean, uh, go to the Code of Alabama to make sure they had done all this because there were objections to it. This is all on the front page of one paper. Uh, the, uh, over 100 cases are on the September docket, and some of those listed are charges Mur murder, forfeiture, larceny, burglary, selling unregistered securities, manufacturing whiskey, assault, refusal to work or pay street tax. I remember my dad talking about back in the 20s and 30s, you had to work so many days on the roads or you had to pay a tax. But apparently these people did neither. I'm not re reading any names, so I'm not going to. But uh, they are named. Several people were... Uh, the town, and it, it's the town of Stepville uh, in this particular docket had arrested about six people for refusing to work or pay street. And there's a number of seduction cases. Now, I don't know what that means. I don't know if they <laughs> did not use perhaps, you know, a word we would use now in the paper, you know, but there is a number of seduction cases. There's no, so I don't know. Uh, do you know what that means, Virgil? <laughs> I mean, really. <laughs> I mean, I don't either, and I would like to go back and look it up because, huh? Would it be the same as sexual harassment? Well, or rape. I wondered if it was rape, and they just did I mean, I don't think they would ever have used that word in the paper back then. Well, it's men being charged. So. Um, the... Um, uh, quickly here because we did want to go on, but this is just so interesting. Uh, the city schools are scheduled to open Monday, September 7th. Book lists and books can be had at the George Stiefelmeyer store. Uh, no books should be bought until definite classification has been made. Uh, health authorities think that it will be safe for children to attend school after the recent infantile paralysis epidemic. No new cases have been reported in the past two weeks, the the uh, so that one is different. The junior, the county schools were scheduled to open earlier, and their uh, theirs have been delayed because of the infantile paralysis situation. Uh, one last one here. I just thought this was, I thought this was really funny, and we're not political here, and I'm not. This is not political. By the way, the name of the paper is the Coleman Democrat, which what, later. Uh, August 27th, 1936, which later combined, it was the Times Democrat and then the Coleman Times. But, um, so I would think the, the feeling of the people that had the paper was democratic, and this is 1936, of course, during the Roosevelt administration. But there's a letter 
to the consumers of TVA electricity in Coleman County. Uh, on Monday evening of this week at a meeting of prospective consumers of TVA and ele electricity and others held in the West Point School Auditorium, there were remarks made uh, by the chairman, and I'm not going into all the names, but which I believe were misleading as to the attitude and feeling of the people of, of the city of Coleman toward the success of Coleman County in obtaining electricity to brighten the homes, lighten the burden, and in general make life more worth living. Kind of, instead of electricity, think damn and water. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's different, but the same. The people of the city of Coleman are not kickers. They are not enemies of the TVA, but want to be friends and are willing to cooperate them so long as they feel that they are not doing themselves an injury. You undoubtedly realize that to build the lines which the TVA has built in the county costs uh, an enormous amount of money. We have a plant, the city of Coleman, uh, the capacity would have to be increased to take care of the extra load in some way. You may say, that is easy. Just buy from the TVA. All good and well so long as the TVA lasts. But just suppose about the time we get hooked on to the TVA and our little plant has depreciated from the lack of care on it until it is not in condition to be operated, an act of Congress does away with TVA. Then it would spend a lot of money reconditioning the plant or depend on the power company. The TVA was born a Democrat, so why, not let us, so why not let us wait until it has lived successfully through a Republican administration, then we'll be soon enough for us to own. You, have no, you had nothing to lose, talking about county, you had nothing to lose and all to gain, which was not true with us. Uh, yours respectfully, J.N. Nix. Anyway, I just thought those were, those were interesting. J N Nix N I X N I X. You can. You can have it. Mrs. Rawson. Somebody, somebody told me at the museum the other day that the Tribune was Republican and then that was Democrat.